so while we waiting for Professor Stiplett to mobile hotspot from Oxford, um, just a few announcements because today is a long day. So we just want to explain to you what's going to happen and the methodology behind it because some people are leaving uh, in early evening, some people are leaving later today. So if you haven't take, taken photos with all your friends, you should do it because soon they'll be getting on a, on a flight. We have been taking lots of photos. If you have any more photos, uh, our wonderful colleague Maru is here and is developing a photo story and hopefully multiple reels and videos. And I don't understand any of this because I'm too old. Um, but uh, we, you know, we, we hope that you will be able to share some of the, the great photos that you've taken of, of the last three days. Uh, and we will show the photo story in the closing session, right? Uh, today is the day of all virtual speakers, so we ask you for so much patience. Um, but also, it gives you a chance to tweet a lot and to share your photos and to get lots of coffee. Uh, we found a brilliant coffee shop a street away from the hotel. So if you need real coffee like you get in South Africa, like a real flat white, uh, not the Brazilian flat white, then you can go there. So the Brazilians are probably going to kill me after this. Um, but the most important announcement is that in the evening, we really need all of your ideas and your energy, right? So you've been listening for two days. Today is a lot of great content sessions. You're going to learn a lot more. Uh, obviously, we couldn't include all topics and, and, and all suggestions. But in the regional working group sessions, Latin America, entire Latin America, whoever's here from Latin America will be in this room, all right? for the, I think it's a five o'clock session, session seven, if I remember, session seven, the regional working groups, and you'll have an hour and a half. The Africa group will be in the room at the bottom, which is called Excelsior, all right? Asia, uh, whoever's here from Asia will be, not Asia Russell, whoever's here from the continent of Asia will be in Windsor, and then everybody else, which is Europe, North America, etc. Uh, if you're not from those three continents, we're putting you in the coffee room, okay, in the balcony. So you'll be able to sit there. And Francisco um, from MSF, in the beginning of session seven in plenary, will explain to you what we need you to help us with and to discuss and some of the agenda items. So we're asking you already in the morning to think for each region who you would like to ask to moderate that session for you, to help you through that conversation. And ideally, it should be one person from the health movement and one person from the justice movement, uh, uh, climate justice movement, right? But the rapporteurs have been allocated. They are from the organizing group. And the rapporteurs will then come back when we completed all the regional working group uh, discussions. The rapporteurs with all of us will come back to plenary and they will present um, some of the ideas and some of the suggestions towards some of the work we need to do after Rio. Because remember, this is just the beginning. This, this cannot be the end or else we have all wasted our energy, we've wasted our time, and then we're wasting money. So there has to be a commitment that after Rio, that the real work commences. And we want your suggestions and ideas. We don't have an agenda. There is no predetermined declaration or statement or agenda of what needs to happen after Rio. You have to decide this, uh, or we have to decide this for ourselves in each of our regions. Um, and Francisco will explain to you the different pillars, how it's going to work, etc. And so we, we know one and a half hours is not long enough, uh, but, but, but that is what we can sort of put on the table. And when, when that presentation is completed, where we get a snapshot of the different regions, of what is being discussed, or what the priorities are, or what the calls to actions are, or what key advocacy moments are in the next few months. Then we will have a closing address by Dr. Guillaume Long, um, and he's due to give us the title shortly, so it's a bit of a surprise title. Um, and then the final thing is that our surprise speaker for today, because we're showcasing Asia, uh, the continent of Asia, which some of you have gone for the networking zone, um, is going to be somebody from Asia. But you'll only know the name of the speaker when, the, when that particular session starts, and they will tell us a short story uh, about their experience from their continent. 
Um, once the closing address is over, we'd like to take a group photo, but Molly, maybe we should take the group photo at lunch because some people are flying in the evening. So I think before we break for lunch, if, if we can get um, a way in which all of us can, you know, either stand this way or that way or some or on the, on the steps outside, uh, and we'd like to take a group photo. If you don't want to be in, in the photo for social media purposes, then, then don't uh, come into the, into the photo, I think. Uh, that's the only way we can protect you because we're not sure where, where it will be disseminated. Uh, there are frontline activists who cannot be photographed because their lives are at risk. So this is not, you know, we don't, we don't say this trivially about people's consent for photos. So please, if you don't have people's consent, please don't post photos of, of people on social media because um, there are many activists who can't actually uh, have their face on social media. So we really urge you to respect that. Um, and then the final thing is the dinner. And that's the celebrating our activism dinner. It's not at the hotel, good news. Uh, but it is within walking distance of the hotel. So you can join us when you're ready. You can leave when you feel like. You don't have to wait for a bus and you don't have to wait for anybody else. You can, you know, you have total autonomy. If you don't want to come for the dinner, that's also fine. Uh, but please let Molly know if you are coming. If you, for example, said you were coming and you've now changed your mind, just let us know so that we can also remove your name. Okay, and in the tea break or coffee break room, uh, during the break, there will be a list, so just triple check that your name is on or not on, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, Varian, I think the final thing is the power map. So thank you for those who've already been completing the power map. Just to reiterate, green is for I'm Health Justice Initiative, and I'm based in South Africa, so I put the green sticker in South Africa, right, with the name of my organization. But I am dealing, and in fact soon, in June, and we're going to ask you for your solidarity, with three pharmaceutical companies who we are going to court against, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca, to access the vaccine contracts for COVID. All right? And that's been set down. So the three companies I'm dealing with are red, and I'll write the name of those companies, but they're not headquartered in South Africa, and they're not headquartered in Brazil. They are headquartered either in Europe or in the US. So I'm indicating that I live here, but the companies that I have to challenge and hold to account are based usually in the north. And we want to show that graphical representation. So we urge you that by lunchtime, you please fill in the power map because our volunteers and rapporteurs are recording that entire map all of us who are here and all of the companies and many Geneva-based institutions and initiatives who are listed currently on that map so that you will have a graphic representation of that and that will then be shown before the regional work so you can also understand what we're dealing with in terms of power asymmetries. And shortly in the next 48 hours, hopefully our website team will be able to capture uh, the graphic uh, image of the map with all of the details of the names because some people's handwriting is really bad. So we're having to retype it. Um, but then that will also be on the website. And then I know many people are asking for, I want Solange's slide, I want this person's slides, I want uh, maybe Brooke Baker's slides. The PowerPoints are being loaded and I think by Monday or Tuesday the full set of slides of everybody's presentations, if they use PowerPoint, will be on the website. And our team is working really hard overnight. They're currently placing the recording of every single session on the website. So if you want to go back to a session or if you want to ask your team in your office to listen to certain sessions, they will be there and they will be available for, for everybody to watch and, and to listen to. Molly, have I covered everything? Any questions on logistics or structure or anything like that? No, great. So we're waiting for Oxford and hopefully commence soon. Oh, yeah, and the hub visit, thanks. Uh, Susanna, it's all, everybody's just, okay. If you're going on the hub visit, just remember eight o'clock tomorrow morning, the bus leaves. Thanks.
Okay. He's with us. His computer crashed, and he's with us through his phone, so he just ran to get his notes. So stand by for one more second. Hello? There you go. All right. Yay. We can see you, and hopefully you can see us. Can you hear us, Joe? Can you turn up the volume? Can you hear us? I can hear Okay, so with no further ado, friends, colleagues, may I please introduce Joe Stiglitz to give his remarks, and then afterwards we will get into a conversation. Joe, welcome to Rio, where you have many colleagues, friends, and family you've worked with for years, and some new friends, leaders of the climate justice and health justice access to medicines movements from around the world. Professor Stiglitz, please. Well, th thank you, and I'm sorry it was so difficult to get on. Um, and it's a real, I, I wish I could be there with you. Uh, let me, uh, the, the subject that, that, that you're talking about is, is uh, extraordinarily important. Um, and let me spend a few minutes uh, putting it into a uh, broader perspective uh, before I uh, get down to talking about some of my uh, particular concerns. Um, intellectual property is a social construction. Um, it's not a matter of natural law. Uh, it's something that uh, a set of rules that we have uh, devised. Uh, when I say we, uh, uh, both uh, in develop and developing countries, and more recently in uh, the context of uh, the WTO and the trade-related intellectual property uh, provisions, um, and it's a, a a set of rules that is supposed to advance the well-being of society. Uh, exposed to uh, balance, incentives to innovate, um, facilitating innovation uh, through the dissemination of knowledge and disseminating the benefits of the knowledge widely. And uh, those very subjectives uh, sometimes come in conflict. Um, we would like the most rapid dissemination of the benefits. And the concern is that uh, if we don't have some way of financing them, uh, it would impede the incentives to innovate. So the design of the intellectual property regime uh, is a matter of balancing uh, these various concerns. Uh, the worry is that the system that has evolved doesn't reflect a good balance. It reflects the interest of the pharmaceutical companies and their desire for profits over anything else, including the welfare of our citizens, their health, and even the imperative for accelerating innovation. So, are you still with me? Or have I lost you? Hello? We can hear you. Maybe you can't hear us. Can you hear us? Okay, because I've lost your view. Okay, uh, I, I don't know what happened, but I lost your view, but let me continue. Um, so, uh, the current rules uh, actually impede innovation. If there is excess intellectual property protections, uh, innovation is impeded because the most important input into any innovation is knowledge itself. And excessively or poorly designed intellectual property regimes 
actually uh, by making knowledge less accessible actually might lead to lower innovation. In the case of drugs, there's another aspect of lowering innovation. The drug companies have an incentive to what we call evergreen, uh, to take actions which enable their innovations, uh, their patents to last longer than the normal 20 years. Uh, one way they do that is by, for instance, uh, taking a basic medicine, delaying the introduction of a time release version, which is often far better. And then in the 19th year, the patent just before it expires, they introduce a time release version. And that gives them effectively another 20 years uh, under patent. Some countries like India have said uh, that doesn't qualify for a patent because to get a patent, it has to be innovative. And just adding a time release version to an ordinary uh, drug isn't really innovative. Anybody could do that. Uh, and that's an example of the kinds of debates that ha have been uh, pervasive uh, around intellectual property. India is absolutely right. Uh, introducing a time release version doesn't constitute a fundamental novel innovation and should not be awarded a separate patent. Um, and that is also an example where extending the patent for another 20 years is not really going to have provided any significant increase in the incentive uh, or ability to innovate. All it does is extend the drug company's monopoly for another 20 years. That monopoly means that it is able to charge higher prices. And that higher prices mean that access to that drug, in some cases could be a very important one, uh, is reduced. Uh, is just a transfer from ordinary individuals or governments who finance uh, the partial cost of the, f uh, of, the of the drug to the drug companies. Uh, the pandemic illustrated that the current rules are not working. In the midst of the pandemic, it was imperative that as many people in the world get access to vaccines, tests, and treatment. We didn't want the drug, the, the disease uh, to, to, to be festering. The longer it festered, the more the mutations uh, with the threat of a mutation that was more contagious, uh, more uh, deadly, even uh, vaccine resistant. So as long as a disease festers, a disease like that, there is a higher probability of a, a uh, mutation which uh, could be disastrous for the whole world. But the drug companies didn't care about that. They put their profits over the well-being of individuals and the well-being of our whole uh, of the whole world. Uh, in this particular case, given the magnitude of the pandemic, our economies were a threat. And uh, because the economies were a threat, particularly poorer people who live in the margins, uh, their lives were a threat. So again, the drug companies put their profits over the lives and well-being of literally hundreds of millions of people around the world. The, uh, this is not the only arena in which intellectual property uh, has proven and is likely to prove to be an important pediment to societal well-being. Uh, one of the existential issues which the world is facing today is climate change. Uh, the uh, ability of countries to respond to climate change 
will in many important ways depend on the access to technology. And critical technologies are in the hands of the advanced countries. Now, uh, in the Rio Agreement, uh, way back in the 90s, there was an agreement that uh, there be the possibility of compulsory licenses, just as was the case in the case of medicine in the original TRIPS agreement. Compulsory licenses mean that uh, the circumscribe the ability of the owner of the patent to have exclusive monopoly. He has to license uh, the, the production, uh, enabling greater dissemination the owner of the patent still gets a royalty fee, but the royalty is set at a reasonable level, not at a monopoly level. So uh, compulsory licenses are important devices for extending the benefits of the property, uh, the intellectual property, giving a just reward to the owner of the patent, but not a monopoly reward. The interesting thing is that in both cases, both in terms of climate and in terms of, of uh, health uh, medicines, uh, the owner, the, the advanced countries have resisted honoring their commitments. Uh, they have resisted the implementation of compulsory licenses. Uh, the, um, issue in the case of uh, uh, the uh, medicines uh, is, uh, and likely to be the case in the case of climate uh, IP, uh, is that the time that it takes to get the compulsory licenses uh, is very large. And in the case of complex uh, products, like some of the new vaccines, uh, or uh, certain chips, there may be uh, dozens of uh, uh, you know, uh, patents involved. And so uh, being able to produce the good in question uh, may be delayed. And in the case of a pandemic, that delay uh, can be enormous. But that delay is exactly what the drug companies want because of the longer the delay, the more profits that accrue to them. Uh, but of course, that delay is what is so costly to our society. Uh, in the beginning uh, of the pandemic, uh, as all of you know, South Africa and India uh, requested a, a waiver of the intellectual property. This was not a fundamental change in the intellectual property regime. Uh, it was just a recognition that patent, uh, that use of, of compulsory licenses is just too slow. And so the waiver would have effectively uh, accelerated uh, the process and made it, uh, uh, access to the intellectual property uh, very quick. Unfortunately, even though more than 100 countries supported the waiver in the vaccines, including the United States, uh, the WTO did not issue that waiver. And then came the more recent issue of testing and treatment. Uh, in many ways, uh, that presents an even greater challenge. Uh, the intellectual, uh, the technology, uh, required to make some of the key tests and treatment is uh, clearly uh, within the grasp of many in the emerging markets and developing countries. Um, and yet uh, the uh, drug companies have resisted a waiver for those, uh, even as the United States and other advanced countries have emphasized the key role that uh, testing and treatment uh, plays in keeping the uh, COVID-19 under control. Let me deal uh, for uh, just a minute with some of the false arguments 
that the drug companies put forward uh, for why there should not be a waiver. Uh, I've already mentioned one of these, which is that it would undermine incentives uh, to innovate. Uh, and it would represent a fundamental change in the intellectual property regime. What I've already emphasized is that within the intellectual property regime, both in the case of drugs and climate, uh, we recognize that there should be uh, access. Uh, we recognize it, uh, compulsory licenses. And all we're doing in the case of waivers is uh, uh, reducing the transaction costs. So it is not even the regime, it's just lowering transaction costs, which if your real objective is not having a compulsory license, delay uh, is really the objective. Uh, another argument uh, that you sometimes hear from the drug companies is the reason that uh, uh, there's a shortage uh, has nothing to do with intellectual property. Um, even if the intellectual property waiver were introduced, uh, the developing countries and the emerging markets uh, don't have the capacity. Uh, and there, there are at least two arguments, uh, two reasons why this argument uh, is suspect. Uh, the first and almost obvious uh, point is that if the drug companies really believed it, then they should say, okay, we'll have a waiver. Nobody will take advantage of it. Uh, you know, if you really believe that uh, there isn't that capacity, well, pass the waiver and we'll see. Of course, they know that that's false, that it's a sort of a, um, a view that denigrates the capacities uh, in the developing countries and emerging markets. We know that there are in many of the countries uh, really uh, high levels of capabilities uh, to produce uh, even complicated uh, uh, pharmaceutical products. But certainly some of the simpler pharmaceutical products uh, that uh, we're talking about uh, today. One of the examples of the way the drug companies try to maintain their monopoly profits is to say, okay, uh, we'll allow, in certain cases, uh, uh, countries to produce, uh, we'll uh, have a, a agreement uh, with them, but we won't allow them to export it. Or we'll give a compulsory license, but only on the condition uh, a condition uh, under some of the WTO rules is you can only produce it for your own country in economies of scale. And it puts small, poor countries at a particular disadvantage. What it's saying is uh, they can't have access to the drugs at low prices uh, simply because they're too small to have their own producers. Uh, it's unfair, it's unjust, um, and uh, it's particularly uh, uh, imprudent in the context of a pandemic uh, where we don't want the disease to fat fester because, as I mentioned, uh, the possibility of mutations. So uh, what we need is not only... Uh, uh, to make compulsory licenses easier, we need a waiver. And as part of that waiver, we have to have uh, the uh, giving countries the right to export to other developing countries and emerging markets. The um, uh, What is clear is uh, that the drug companies have put uh, money uh, over lives. Um, and unfortunately, the advanced countries have put the interest of their drug companies over the lives 
of individuals throughout the world. I think this is obviously an immoral decision. Uh, it should be viewed as unacceptable. Um, you might say uh, it represents uh, uh, an ugly expression of the power of money and politics in America, uh, in Europe, uh, in other uh, countries. But there's another aspect that also disturbs me, uh, the absence of global solidarity on what should be, uh, to my mind, an obvious issue, undermines the need for global solidarity in other arenas. Uh, I've been greatly disturbed by uh, the lack of support among developing countries and emerging markets for the efforts to resist the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but I understand in some ways uh, the response that I sometimes hear from developing countries. Uh, they say, you didn't care about our lives, our well-being during the pandemic. Uh, why should we pay attention to your agenda now? I think uh, what we did in the United States and what Europe did was short-sighted. And it lacked uh, an expression of global solidarity. But I also think that that kind of response, while under, uh, to towards the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, uh, short sighted, uh, I also think it's understandable. Um, let me uh, turn now, in the last few minutes, to uh, the issue of you, you might call the political economy of reform. Uh, I've been very disappointed at the, the inability of the advanced uh, countries to be willing to change the rules the temporarily, the waiver. The, uh, what it says to me is that if we can't get global solidarity on an issue uh, of such obvious uh, concern, of uh, such obvious uh, uh, centrality to the interest of the entire world is the waiver on intellectual property. How are we going to be able to get the solidarity cooperation that we need to address the other fundamental issues that our global, our, our world needs today, including uh, a climate change? Um, I think uh, it, it, there are both uh, uh, moral and strategic issues, why we need to uh, rethink the global rules of climate change. Uh, the question is, uh, the global rules concerning uh, intellectual property, uh, fit for purpose. As I began my remarks, I said uh, that uh, a good intellectual property regime to reflect the balance between innovation, uh, uh, providing uh, access to knowledge, to produce knowledge, and uh, providing uh, access to the knowledge to ensure that the benefits of that knowledge are reaped by all citizens all over the world. Uh, we have failed. Um, uh, failure is particularly stark in the case of the pandemic, where the government is providing the overwhelming part uh, of the cost of the innovation itself. Uh, uh, the drug companies uh, are getting uh, returns on their own investment uh, that are uh, clearly uh, outlandish. Uh, and they would have clearly been willing to do it for a small, far smaller return uh, on their investment. Uh, of course, they want to grab as much as they can. And our politics, our po political economy has allowed them uh, to do that. So the question today is recognizing this, uh, the deficiencies in our, our, our intellectual property regime. What do we do? 
uh, we need to continue to agitate for changes. Uh, we 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 need strong civil society trying to explain what's wrong. Um, as long as we have uh, democracies uh, in most par many parts of the world, uh, citizens should be expressing the view that uh, uh, we shouldn't be putting corporate profits, drug company profits, above the lives of ordinary citizens. But uh, that may not bring fruit or may not bring fruit fast enough. What should countries do in the interim? I believe that uh, this is a moment where countries should uh, go ahead and pass their own laws, uh, make access to these drugs, give protection to their own generic producers to produce this medicine and to export uh, this medicine, uh, these medicines. Uh, a kind of civil disobedience, uh, but recognized uh, not only by individual citizens, but by the governments. Um, we need to recognize that the ability to enforce uh, the WTO TRIPS rules right now is uh, very limited. Uh, the uh, WTO appellate body uh, has been uh, disempowered by the refusal of the United States to allow uh, the appointment of the judges necessary uh, for the court to function. Uh, so at least at this moment, uh, I would encourage countries to go ahead and defy these unjust uh, laws, these unjust uh, rules that were shaped uh, overwhelmingly by the influence of the drug companies. Um, even when there uh, uh, is a ruling, it, it is extraordinarily hard to enforce those rulings. So just as the drug companies have tried to maximize the transaction costs, making it difficult for the issuance of a compulsory licenses, I think the, the developing countries and emerging markets should respond in kind and increase the transaction costs for the drug companies to try to enforce what they, uh, their, their uh, unjust uh, intellectual property and their refusal uh, to comply with compulsory licenses. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, uh, countries should take an active stance working together to issue compulsory licenses uh, in uh, countries uh, um, all over uh, where there's a, a medical justification uh, for the issuance uh, of those uh, uh, compulsory licenses and uh, should use the provisions of the Rio Agreement to start issuing compulsory licenses in climate-related intellectual property. Uh, the issues that we're talking about, pandemics and climate change, are existential for our planet and for the well-being of everybody on our planet. Um, I began my remarks by saying that, in effect, the intellectual property regime that was embodied in the WTO and the TRIPS agreement is not fit for purpose. It was not fit for purpose in 1995, when it first went into pro uh, 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 being, uh, and it's uh, even more uh, not fit for purpose more than a quarter century later. And so it's time for us to work for a new global intellectual property regime and to resist the enforcement of the current intellectual property regime uh, in every way that we can. Thank you. Are you there? We sure yeah. are. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz. I'm going to turn over the moderation to my colleague Carlos from Oxfam, who, because of these technical difficulties, is actually 
going to start in English because you can't get this, the, tra the translation. Um, so, Carlos, please. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, and thank you, Professor, for your explanation. I think that was a very good explanation about how the current rules thinking. Are, are you listening to me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. I, I'm okay. holding you. Uh, I'm, I'm apologizing. I'm going to put your more closer to the ear so your the, the camera picture may not be very great. It's okay, Professor. No problem. Thank you so much for your participation. I I I said that I think that you introduce and you um, talk about an excellent explanation about how the current rules thinking on intellectual property system uh, in innovation and knowledge are not working around the world and how the pandemic uh, conditions for us was an excellent situation to understand why we need to change the rules thinking about not just the situation about uh, innovation system, but when we are talking about the climate change situation around the world. Uh, that you know, I, I work it on Oxfam, and for us, inequality is a very specific challenge around the world. And one of the most important challenge when we are thinking about the global conditions, um, this is because I want to start uh, to ask you, um, when you say that the, the current rules about innovation and knowledge in thinking on intellectual property is not working, I am thinking at the same time, what happened with the multimillionaires people around the world and the data that we use in Oxfam to, to uh, demonstrate that around uh, the, the capital of the multimillionaires in, in the last year was increased around five billion billions of dollars during the pandemic. And how many people, the World Bank mentioned it, 97 millions of people that increased the poverty conditions around the world. And I, th I, I am thinking at the moment, if these rules is not working for who? And I, 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 I will ask you, um, and I want uh, to, to, um, to ask you about the possibility that you comment what happened with this rule when we are thinking about companies and multimillionaires and what happened with the people in the countries. Yes, and uh, at the same that, time, the sorry. very good question. Uh, yeah, um, let me. Um, uh, my battery is getting weak here. I'm going to have to plug this in, and I hope. Um, hello. Yeah, I can. I can hear you. Please go. Go ahead. Good. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, there are many aspects of your of your question uh, of the interaction between intellectual property and inequality. Uh, the first is that intellectual property, as we've implemented, has given rise to a lot of monopoly power. Monopoly power uh, means that wealth goes to the very rich and ordinary citizens have to pay higher prices, which means their real income adjusted for inflation goes down. So uh, uh, the intellectual property is an inequality increasing aspect, uh, consequence of uh, uh, the unjust intellectual property regime. The second point is that uh, the high price of medicines and the lack of access to medicines, particularly in the developing countries and emerging markets, means that 
poor people don't get the medicines they need. And that lowers uh, their, uh, weakens their health, uh, that lowers their income, and uh, impoverishes them in so many ways. COVID-19, of course, uh, exposed the inequalities in our society, but it also exacerbated them. So we can think of it in intellectual property regime, the current one, as one which has played a important role in increasing uh, the uh, inequalities uh, in our society. And uh, a, a particular aspect of inequalities, uh, ones where I know that uh, Oxfam has uh, called attention to at various times, is not just income and wealth inequalities that you were mentioning, but health inequities. Um, in the United States, uh, we know that there are huge disparities between the health status of the very rich and the health status of the very poor. The life expectancy uh, uh, mark years differences. And uh, one of the reasons for that is access to medicines. Uh, poor people can't afford the medicines. And in some places in the United States, uh, we don't have adequate uh, uh, public provision of health services for the poor. So uh, this is an, another aspect, a way in which uh, intellectual property uh, exacerbates the inequalities uh, in multiple dimensions in our society. I should add that I worry that uh, this will be compounded by uh, climate change and uh, access to intellectual property associated with the climate change. And so as we think about this, these issues, uh, it is clear that intellectual property is an important ingredient in the huge disparities, both within countries and between countries. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, continuing the reflection with you, I, I think that uh, um, I, I can call this situation like a trap of inequality. But when you finish your speech, you mentioned the relevance of the participation, social participation, citizen participation, and you mentioned the importance of the, of the democracy system. I think so that my colleagues in the room have another questions and another interventions thinking about these issues that you mentioned today. Joe, we're going to take questions from the audience, and we're going to start from Fatima Hassan, who I think you know from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, thank you, Professor Stichlitz, um, and, and really appreciate the fact that you've been calling out the injustice, unjustness and unfairness of the WTO and the TRIPS agreement and its rules, and uh, being very, I think, brave in in calling it ethically indefensible in the middle of the pandemic when many of our people were getting sick and dying. My question to you is your views on the role of the WTO Secretariat, and in particular the DG, in defending this unjust system, given some of the remarks she made a few weeks ago on climate and IP and the role of TRIPS and the WTO, and sort of a preliminary indication that she would be open to waiving those rules. But in contrast, a complete defensiveness, and in our view in civil society, an arrogance in defending uh, the pharmaceutical companies uh, during this period in, in, in the process of the TRIPS waiver. Because I suppose what I'm trying to highlight is it not just rules on paper, there are actual people in Geneva that are defending the system and propping it up. Thank you. And Joe, may yeah. we have uh, a few people ask questions and then we'll combine the answers. Okay. Should I go? Yeah. 
So I'm going to take a mic to the translation booth so you can hear a question from our colleague in, from Argentina who's going to be in Spanish. Okay. Muchas gracias, profesor. Um, Eh, muchísimas gracias por la exposición. Me interesó mucho eh, lo de cambiar las reglas. Eh, me parece súper eh, valioso esto de pensar la desobediencia. ¿no? Eh, estas, eh, y eso eh, me hizo pensar que nosotros tenemos internamente, eh, por ejemplo, para la confesionalidad religiosa, o sea, sistemas de eh, resistencia a las leyes ¿no? eh, que están autorizadas dentro del mismo sistema legal. Eh, y entonces eh, pensaba, por ejemplo, este tipo de desobediencia de los estados ¿no? como forma también eh, de, de legitimar digamos, acciones eh, en relación a la propiedad intelectual. Pero eh, la pregunta es eh, si podríamos recurrir para cambiar estas reglas a otras instituciones jurídicas Saliéndonos un poco del campo económico, eh, por ejemplo, no sé, eh, pensaba en la expropiación temporal en caso de pandemias, de las licencias eh, eh, y patentes, o sea, insumos críticos, tecnologías vinculadas a la salud. O sea, si podría pensarse en que no rige, por ejemplo, el principio de inviolabilidad de la propiedad privada. Eh, temporalmente, al menos en contextos de pandemia. Eh, incluso eh, nacionalización eh, de empresas, laboratorios, porque esas son cuestiones que tienen mucho costo político, digamos, para un Estado, eh, pero que podrían, o sea, eh, por ejemplo, en propiedad, en, en vivienda, se han utilizado las expropiaciones para responder a una función social, ¿no? O una utilidad pública mayor, un bien mayor, ¿no? Podríamos, digamos, recurrir o acordar entre los países que eh, como un principio, o sea, el principio de inviolabilidad de la propiedad intelectual no rige. Okay, technical glitch, the translation didn't come across. So who may summarize? I'm so sorry. This important question. Can someone summarize it in English for Professor Stiglitz? I I didn't I didn't get all of it. So what I, what I understood was that, uh, so our colleague Natalia from Argentina really likes the idea of disobedience. So the idea of disobedience of the rules that are currently in place. Um, and I'm sorry we can't summarize everything, but she was wondering if there's a way to encourage a position that says we will refuse to abide by the rules that are in place, the IP rules. Would that be a stance that countries or multinational inst entities could take to say we are not going to abide by these rules that govern intellectual property. So okay. through institutes that. that already exist. And also the idea of expropriating yeah. in reverse, which I think is a very powerful idea of expropriating the commons back from the grabbers of the commons and the common good. And the concept has already been used in housing and in other things. Okay. Do you want me to answer? Okay. We're going to wait. have one more, more question. One more question from Morocco. Uh, good morning, Professor. I'm Otman Melouk from Morocco. I would like to have your opinion on the emergence these last years or you know, past decades of voluntary mechanisms as the miracle solution to fix, you know, the patent problems when it comes to access to medicines through voluntary licenses of the medicine patent pool, CTAP during COVID. And the problem that raises in the sense that these licenses we know exclude many countries, including low and middle, uh, middle income countries, 
they give the illusion that the problem is solved and it's solved by the industry itself who is responsible and come in with solutions. It prevents countries from taking action and using their rights. And also sometimes it creates monopolies where there are no monopolies because we see a lot of countries where no patents are granted are excluded from voluntary license. Then there was no problem before. And because of the license, then we have now a market monopoly. So what do you think about these mechanisms and the fact that now it is used by pharma as a PR, that they are responsible and solving the problem. And also, it's an excuse from WTO and other institutions or whatever uh, to avoid to address the problem and to say, okay, it's, it's solved. Thank you. Joe, I'm sorry, one more. Thank you, Mr. Stiglitz. My name is Karin and I come from Guatemala. I was just wondering your opinion about um, this rebellious uh, position about a countries producing their own vaccines. In that context, what do you think about the Cuban effort to produce their own vaccines and the magnificent uh, process they carried out vaccinating their people? However, we cannot have access to those vaccines. The mixture between politics and um, a trade a regulations is very difficult to overcome. Is there something you can comment about that? Thank you. We have one more, and I'm looking for someone who can do Portuguese. Who can translate, summarize in Portuguese? Okay. Ma'am? Bom dia a todos, todas e todes. Meu nome é Regina. Eu estou falando aqui do Brasil. É, em termos de propriedade intelectual versus conhecimentos tradicionais e essas regras, assim, me quem curiosa de pensar como que essas regras vão se ajustar ao roubo intelectual daquilo que não é reconhecido como intelectual, né? Yeah, she was trying to think about intellectual property and the traditional knowledge, and that normally there is some stealing from this this um, traditional knowledge, saying that it's not intellectual. How can we think about this? É, seria é importante tanto os, to, todos os países do sul, os países africanos e na América vem sendo é, desconstituído, destituído deste intelecto, pela própria palavra de propriedade intelectual que coloca um único tipo de intelecto. Many countries from Latin America and Africa are losing um, a lot on this because what they produce is not recognized as intellectual property because it is traditional knowledge. So we are losing. Então, a curiosidade e a pergunta é, estas novas regras ajustam essa injustiça? A injustiça do roubo dos povos originários e dos povos tradicionais? So, the new rules on intellectual property are, are things like that. Does that compensate what has happened in the long time regarding this um, steal from the traditional knowledge? Obrigada. Hey, Joe, fire away, please. Just a few questions. Okay, great questions. Uh, highlight issues in many facets of the uh, uh, actual property regime. Um, the uh, first question, uh, what uh, I want to comment on is uh, the... Uh, role of the um, uh, of the WTO and uh, the seeming contradiction between uh, position on uh, climate and position on drugs. Uh, now, I think one to begin by understanding that the difficult position 
position the DG is in. Um, the WTO is uh, structured where it's supposed to be consensus-based, uh, which has traditionally meant virtual unanimity. And uh, the task of the DG is uh, like a conductor and orchestra. Uh, it has to bring everybody together. But unfortunately, there's no way you can do that in the context of uh, drugs because uh, several of the countries, not very many, but a few of the countries seem to be owned, uh, I'll put it uh, in a strong way, owned by the drug companies. Uh, and they put the interest of their citizens and the citizens elsewhere uh, second to the profits of the drug company. And so uh, I have, uh, you might say, sympathy, not agreement, but sympathy with the impossibility, difficulty uh, of the position. Um, she wants something to happen, and she knows she can't make something just happen. She can't make something that's fair to happen. She has to reach, uh, have something uh, uh, that uh, is... Uh, second, third, fourth, best. Um, a disappointment uh, that uh, uh, the world is such that she doesn't feel that she can come out strongly and say, let's be clear, uh, restrictions on exports, uh, failure to have a, a patent waiver is putting the WTO in jeopardy, uh, putting uh, the world in jeopardy, um, you know, I, I, I think I probably uh, think that would have been uh, uh, a stronger course, maybe a wiser course, but I have to say I'm not sure it would have accomplished uh, anything because I think uh, given the consensual nature, uh, consensus basis of the WTO, I'm not sure uh, anything uh, would have gotten through. Uh, I'm hopeful that in the context of climate, vested interests have not built up in the way they have in the pharmaceutical industry, and they're not so concentrated um, uh, that uh, IP related to climate change uh, isn't, uh, um, doesn't uh, the world realizes that climate change is an existential issue and uh, monopoly power uh, is not so extensive in this area. And uh, we might be able to get, you might say, a just intellectual property regime for climate. So uh, I think one has to interpret the seeming inconsistency of the DG's position in terms of the realities uh, of the of, uh uh, of the current uh, political, global political scene, that doesn't mean uh, uh, that it's uh, uh, the appropriate or best uh, uh, answer, but it is understandable given that reality. Now, Natalia asked a question about uh, what can uh, countries do uh, to um, uh, facilitate what I uh, uh, described as civil disobedience. I think one of the things that individual and groups of countries, and I think uh, it might make sense for large groups of countries to get together, uh, their strength in numbers here, is to have a mutual identification, an indemnification agreement and say, you know, should it come to pass that um, the uh, drug companies win a court case demanding compensation for the violation of their intellectual property, which I think uh, is not likely to happen given the current uh, uh, position of the WTO, but say, should that happen, they would agree to first not enforce that court finding in any of their countries, uh, making it very difficult for anybody winning that 
to actually uh, collect on that. And secondly, that should they succeed in collecting, uh, they will share the risk. And that would give comfort uh, to companies wanting to go ahead. You know, I've heard that uh, in some developing countries, there are emerging markets, there are companies that believe that they have the capacity to uh, make certain key COVID-19 products, but they're afraid. They're afraid because they'll, they'll be sued. And so uh, that kind of uh, collective indemnification uh, passed in legislation of countries um, will give uh, uh, companies uh, comfort that they can go ahead. Um, there was a very interesting question about uh, the role of voluntary licenses. Voluntary licenses are not, as the question posed pointed out, a substitute for compulsory licenses. Uh, they can play some role, um, but one should be clear that simply because a company has given a voluntary license uh, doesn't mean that there still isn't need for a compulsory license. And uh, the discussion uh, provided one of the reasons for that, because the voluntary license may be a license to a single firm giving monopoly power uh, within the country. And monopoly power within a country may not be quite as bad as a monopoly power by a multinational, but it's still monopoly power, at least to high prices and uh, deprivation of access. So um, uh, that's just one reason. Another reason uh, illustrated by the uh, license that was given in Dominican Republic by Pfizer, which uh, uh, had uh, very strong restrictions, including a restriction for selling the drug inside Dominican Republic. Uh, in other cases, there are restrictions against exporting, so it could only be consumed within the country. So voluntary licenses come with uh, a variety of uh, constraints. Uh, sometimes voluntary licenses uh, also are designed to limit the transfer technology. And uh, that's a broader issue that I wanted to discuss and didn't have time to. Um, one of the things that we ought to be thinking about right now is the next pandemic. And we can be fairly sure that there will be another pandemic. Hopefully we uh, it won't happen, but we ought to be at least be thinking about how to be more prepared for the next pandemic. And being better prepared means having production capabilities for vaccines, tests, and treatments, uh, and having those capacities throughout the developing world and emerging markets. And one way to do that is, uh, the best way is actually you begin producing and uh, producing COVID-19 products and, and other products. Um, and uh, there needs to be that transfer technology. Now, in some cases, um, the develop the the uh, owners do everything they can to prevent that full transfer of technology because in the end they want to maintain uh, their uh, advantage. What is ironic is that in many cases, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, the basic. Uh, uh, research and even some of the applied research and the IPR we're talking about was financed by government. Uh, in the case of the, the Moderna plant, uh, 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 vaccine, uh, the U.S. government actually owned uh, at least one of the critical uh, patents. And it should have used its market power over that patent to ensure that Moderna transferred its technology to emerging markets and developing countries. So uh, the important point I, I, I do want to emphasize is the uh, inadequacy 
of uh, voluntary agreements. Um, in many cases, uh, as was pointed out, uh, more a publicity stunt than a real attempt to um, uh, make sure that there is widespread dissemination. Uh, uh, the broader issue that was raised by uh, several of the questions is uh, how do we get a broader dissemination of vaccines? And I would extend it to uh, other uh, health products, uh, treatments, tests. Um, one way I think that is important is, especially in the context of uh, the regulatory regimes, is to have more collective action in uh, testing uh, of the drugs, both for safety and efficacy. Uh, there's no reason why every country uh, has to test it. Uh, the people in one country are uh, similar to that of others. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, data exclusivity that is being used as an important ingredient in, in restricting uh, access to medicines uh, can't be justified. But in any case, uh, um, the developing countries and emerging markets ought to work collectively uh, to do that kind of testing, share the data, and have uh, uh, common uh, standards applicable. And that might uh, itself uh, uh, facilitate uh, the dissemination. At the same time, uh, they can uh, do a, uh, work together to share uh, technology. Um, the um, final question, which I'll comment on uh, very, very briefly, is um, uh, concerns uh, traditional uh, knowledge. Now, I would add to that not only uh, 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 is there a problem with traditional knowledge, uh, there is a, a problem with uh, the intellectual property associated with genetic material uh, associated with biodiversity. Uh, the United States and some other advanced countries under the influence of their uh, pharmaceutical companies have refused to ratify the biodiversity agreement. Uh, a, a key reason for that refusal is that that would require uh, compensation for uh, the uh, genetic material uh, taken out of uh, the countries that have done so much to preserve their biodiversity. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it appears as if uh, uh, the intellectual property uh, within the advanced countries needs to be protected, uh, but not that uh, within developing countries and emerging markets. The asymmetries here are, are, are glaring and, and, and disturbing. Uh, one of the perspectives on intellectual property that uh, if I had time, I would have discussed more uh, is that provided uh, by uh, Professor Boyle of Duke University, who describes uh, the intellectual property as uh, uh, the 20th, 20th century. He was writing uh, uh, a, a couple of decades ago, a 20th century enclosure movement where ideas that were uh, in uh, the common domain, the public domain, uh, were taken out of the public domain and put in the, in the hands uh, of a few. Uh, and they use that to uh, extract monopoly profits, contributing to the inequality that we discussed earlier today. Um, the uh, dramatic example of that, uh, that I write about in my book, uh, Making Globalization Work, uh, was the case of the uh, um, uh, American doctors of Indian descent who got a patent for uh, the healing properties of turmeric, uh, which is a, a traditional, uh, used traditionally as a med med uh, medicinal quality, well known, uh, in India, um, uh, and uh, yet uh, the U.S. Patent Office granted a patent for this. Uh, 
uh, it's clear that uh, that kind of patent reduces uh, health. Um, remember, I began my talk by saying we have to have a balance between uh, uh, incentives for innovation, ability for innovation, access to knowledge for innovation, and access to knowledge for uh, ensuring that the benefits of knowledge are widely shared. And uh, the turmeric uh, patent is an example where there are no benefits uh, on uh, the innovation side, but enormous costs were that uh, patent to be enforced. Uh, there are similar patents on neem oil. Uh, there was even a patent uh, given on uh, basmati rice. Uh, uh, and uh, as you know, uh, uh, many of the tr uh, traditional uh, products in uh, uh, Latin America. So uh, the issue of, of the uh, patenting of traditional medicines and patenting naturally occurring genes and biodiversity uh, or not giving intellectual property rights to those who preserve uh, this genetic material are all examples of the inequities and inefficiencies and distortions in our current intellectual property regime. I began uh, my remarks by emphasizing that intellectual property is a social construction. It's something that we make and when we need to design it to enhance global social welfare. Fortunately, the way the TRIPS has been designed within the WTO has been to design, uh, design to maximize the profits of the drug companies at the expense of the citizens all over the world. And I think it's important for us to work to reform that intellectual property regime and uh, demand uh, uh, that uh, we have a better intellectual property regime, uh, one which serves the, uh, the interests of all of our citizens. Thank you very much, Joe. Hopefully you can pick up the applause and cheering that just was happening. We have 20 more minutes oh, together. Good, thank you. We have 20 more minutes together and I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask any questions of people here. And I'm gonna put down my email where people can email answers in whatever your language is preferable. I'll get it translated and then send it to Joe. So it's your opportunity to ask all of these leading thinkers and doers from around the world if you have questions of them that can help your work, like they've been asking you questions to help their work. And then after that, if you are ready to share some questions, then Carlos will take some more few questions from the audience, and that will be our last 20 minutes together. So Joe, do you have some questions you'd like to hear the answers from these folks? I, I have a, a, I mean, one of the questions uh, concerns uh, the uh, oh, um, disobedience that uh, uh, we've been talking about. Uh, 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 active resistance. Uh, I know Brazil has uh, done some things, uh, even within the WTO framework that has given it uh, uh, greater latitude. So the, que the question is, um, uh, first, uh, do they think their own country is using, uh, to the extent that it can, all the flexibilities, uh, doing all it can to uh, issue all the compulsory licenses that they have a right to do? In other words, uh, taking advantage of uh, the admittedly flawed intellectual property regime, but making sure, you know, and, and when we write down a, uh, any law, there are, there are loopholes, uh, we make mistakes in writing and, and, and getting their lawyers together to say, uh, within this very flawed regime, 
let's do everything we can to help our citizens. So that's the first question. And secondly, what is the appetite for taking an even stronger stance and say, look, there's some ambiguities here. Some cases it's not, it may or may not be ambiguous, but uh, every country has the right obligation to put the well-being of its citizens over the profits of uh, uh, multinational drug companies. Uh, I think it's a, 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 an imperative, an obligation of every government to do that. Um, and if in some cases uh, that, that uh, uh, puts the country at risk of, of uh, a conflict, well, uh, let's try to, you know, the, the, see how that conflict gets managed. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, it would be very difficult uh, for the Biden administration or the Schultz administration in Germany uh, to say uh, we explicitly are going to defend our drug companies uh, over the, the lives of those in developing countries and emerging markets. So uh, the question is, is there an appetite within their country to take uh, that kind of a more aggressive uh, stance. Start. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Uh, Solange Batiste from ITPC, uh, based in South Africa. Just a very simple question, but maybe hard to answer. Um, during the COVID pandemic, from your perspective, what would you say that we did wrong? Because I think if we were to make up a scenario of a respiratory disease that was global and we would finally be able to come together and have an opportunity to change the system, it happened. But clearly, either we didn't do something right or uh, the system is not working. So what would you have done differently or how do you see the problem with during COVID as a, as a major lesson to us? Thanks. Um, this, I'm, professor, sorry. It on the positive the side, uh, Maybe I we think collect. the world, uh, uh, we did, uh, the, the speed with which we produced uh, the vaccines uh, uh, was very, very impressive. Uh, but uh, as I say, the main mistake was we allowed not only vaccine apartheid to develop, uh, but also... Uh, 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 apartheid in, in uh, testing and treatment. Uh, and so uh, that was uh, clearly uh, a very big flaw. Um, you know, I, I wish uh, there could have been uh, a stronger support for the waiver. Now, uh, when you say, what did you do wrong? South African government, when it uh, did put this before the WTO, and uh, it didn't get a response. Uh, uh, I think uh, what should have done is South Africa and India uh, should have said, you know, we're in the middle of COVID-19. Uh, this is not the time to uh, uh, be engaged in, in a legal hassle of what is the right or wrong thing. Uh, we know it is what is the right thing, and that's saving people's lives. We're going to go ahead and produce the vaccine. And my understanding is that there were uh, uh, companies with the capacity to do it in both India and South Africa, and um, certainly with the capacity to produce plaques of it and, and uh, tests and treatments. Um, so uh, what I think... Uh, uh, this kind of civil disobedience uh, is what I think, uh, you know, what, given that the U.S. Germany didn't respond adequately to the uh, uh, request of uh, India and South Africa, I think what India and South Africa did wrong was not, uh, they should have gone ahead and indemnified the companies within their country that when it would go ahead and produce the, the drug. And my understanding that there were companies that had the capacity, but uh, 
the companies were afraid of a suit. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Stiglitz. This is Melinda St. Louis from uh, Public Citizen. I wondered if you could comment on the intersection between these trade rules that include the intellectual property rules and the extreme investment rules that are included in free trade agreements and investment agreements that have been used by corporations to bully and seek compensation for access to medicines, environmental measures, et cetera. It's, um, given that there's been a shift in the politics of some of the northern countries with the U.S. administration no longer seeking these provisions in future trade agreements and European governments that have withdrawn from the Energy Charters Treaty, as well as the multiple crises, including climate change. Would you have any comments on you know, the political appetite and potential global South-North strategy to work to address the legacy of these provisions in, some, in the existing agreements and investment treaties? Thanks. Two or three questions more, yeah, that's Professor. Question, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, that I need time to address. Sorry. Uh, We're going to get a couple uh, more questions. Could... Stand by. We'll get a couple more questions, and then we'll have an right. answer. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation here, Professor Stiglitz. And my name is Veriano Terto. I am from here, from Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. Um, uh, ABIA is my organization. My question is concerning, uh, it's not exactly a question, but uh, a question and comment uh, related with uh, fund funding for civil society. There is a kind of consensus that it is necessary or it is uh, important a stronger participation of the civil society in this debate in pushing for uh, changes in the uh, IP uh, system in the world. But on the other side, uh, fewer, less and less money uh, to do that work. And, th and this work is expensive. For instance, this meeting here where we are to convene all these people from different regions of the world is very expensive. And we have less and less money. So what is the role of the international philanthropy of the foundations of the government? Uh, funding this kind uh, of work. Uh, some years ago, we used to have some more money, but now it's changing. You know? uh, during the COVID pandemic, we heard lots of beautiful discourses of philanthropic foundations and agencies saying that they would put money for, uh, on civil society. But at least here in Brazil, and I'm sure in other Latin American countries, we didn't see that. No, we are almost working without money uh, to put pressure on that. And it is sad because at nowadays in Brazil we have a good, a better political climate to push for using, for instance, the, the uh, uh, TRIPS flexibilities to uh, improve or to strengthen this, uh, the debate, the public debate on patent. But uh, where is the money to do that? No. Uh, so uh, my idea is to hear your comments on what is the role of the philanthropy, of the international philanthropy and this uh, uh, cooperation no, uh, to support civil society. Hi, Professor uh, Graziali Custodio Davi from Oxford in Latin America. Usually companies say that there is no innovation um, without intellectual property. But when we take a deeper look, we see that there is no innovation without public investment. Because normally it's the public investment that finances um, the first and second sta stage of production med medicines, and that is very expensive. And these public investments usually comes from tax. Um, so we could say that actually those who are paying taxes are investing in these companies and they are getting nothing back. They are getting no dividends, they are getting no um, capital gain back, and they are getting no access to medicines, to vaccines, and all of that. Do you think that using the idea of tax, we could innovate on the litigation and talking about not only the right to health, but the right from investors, the right from contributors on the process to reduce um, the limitations of intellectual property? Thank you. Hello, my name is Morga Kamaliani. Um, 
from the People Vaccine Alliance. I want to answer the professor's question about countries' appetite to use the TRIPS flexibility and just say that before using the TRIPS flexibility, it's about the country appetite to manage IP. So in my country, when everybody was talking about the patent and the compulsory license and whatever of Sophos Bavir for treating hepatitis C, actually my country negotiated with Gilead to have um, the medicine at lower price without patent. So it wasn't patented in my country and um, we had it at lower price for a certain time until our generic company started producing the medicine and now we have um, the, me the, the generic medicine is being provided all over the country because we have high level of hep C and this, yes, in Egypt. And this is how I think it's, there's a good learning there about managing IP starts before you need to issue compulsory license. Just check the patent application carefully. Um, and then you can use the flexibilities if you can't, if you have to issue a patent. Thank you. Thank you, Moga and Professor Stiglitz. Please, your thoughts. Okay. Begin the question on investment agreements is a very interesting and, and important one. Um, I think countries should get out of these investment agreements as fast as they can. Uh, South Africa, a number of years ago, uh, gave uh, notice that it was leaving. Uh, and now that the appetite for those investment agreements has gone not only from the developing emerging markets, but also from the advanced countries. Uh, under President Trump, uh, the, own, the major difference between NAFTA and the new agreement uh, between the United States, Canada, and Mexico was dropping almost all the provisions of the investment chapter, chapter 11. Um, so uh, the fact that these investment agreements uh, uh, are uh, viewed badly, uh, both in advance and, and the developing and emerging markets, gives us an, a, an opportunity to get rid of them. But in the meanwhile, they are a threat. Um, they are a threat in the sense that uh, uh, countries uh, risk uh, being sued under the uh, provisions of the ISDS, Investor State Dis uh, uh, Dispute uh, Mechanism, uh, if they were to undertake uh, the kind of uh, more aggressive uh, intellectual property uh, actions that I talked about. But again, uh, the issue that I would uh, highlight is uh, the enforcement of these is very difficult. Uh, and particularly if there is a common recognition that uh, these are unjust uh, agreements and that the intellectual property provisions that they're trying to enforce are unjust. So um, I think that uh, the, uh, you know, one has to lawyer this carefully, but I would encourage countries to nonetheless go ahead with the uh, kind of uh, 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 widespread issuance of compulsory licenses, because those are within the WTO and, and um, are, use all the flexibilities uh, that are currently available and push against the boundaries. Uh, the uh, question about uh, the uh, funding of civil society is an important one. Um, some governments have recognized that uh, the uh, very important role that civil society plays in the functioning of our society. So some countries have uh, provided uh, finance uh, in one way or another to uh, civil society, to independent media, um, uh, allocate that, uh, which group gets access to the funding is a very difficult uh, issue. Um, and uh, 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 some do it according to foundations related to uh, the voting uh, 
uh, and link it to the uh, uh, political process. Um, and foundations uh, in some countries have played a very important role. But, you know, I couldn't agree with you more on uh, the uh, key importance of finding the su uh, sustainable ways of funding uh, civil society. Uh, the third question uh, had, uh, uh, emphasized uh, the key role of public investments in innovation. And um, the, uh, uh, that you could not have um, uh, most of the uh, important innovations uh, without uh, the basic research, and in many cases, even the applied research of government. Uh, the importance of this has been stressed, but for instance, by uh, Mariana Masakato in her book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State. Uh, the um, question is, what is the appropriate way uh, to uh, take advantage, uh, to recognize this and to take advantage of it? One way uh, I already mentioned is uh, the uh, needs to uh, patent its intellectual property, the intellectual property that it produces. Doesn't mean it has to exercise that intellectual property right, uh, but the ownership of that intellectual property right gives it bargaining power. So, for instance, I referred earlier to the Moderna, uh, where the, uh, certain uh, 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 a patent uh, of the government related to the mRNA platform uh, should have been used not just to get compensation uh, payments to the U.S. government, and what we got paid was a fraction of what we should have gotten paid, but... Uh, to use it to leverage power to say you have to transfer technology to developing countries and emerging markets to make sure there's broader access, particularly uh, in given the public interest in getting the pandemic uh, under control. So uh, I think that uh, uh, once one recognizes that government has played an absolutely vital role in almost all the innovations that from which we benefited, including, and maybe I should say, especially in the health sphere, uh, the government has not used uh, what uh, the market, you might say, the market power, the, intellect, uh, the property rights that it should have gotten uh, in ways uh, that would have enabled it to circumscribe the monopoly power of the drug companies and ensure that access to the drugs uh, uh, and medicines and therapeutics were more widely spread. Those were great questions, and let me thank you for the answer to the question that uh, I posed, uh, at least for the case of Egypt. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz. Just a reminder and clarification for everyone. I put my email here to send me the answer to Professor Stiglitz's question about the appetite in different parts of the world to take direct action and anything else you want to share with him because our time was limited and he is a very curious person. So email the answers to Professor Stiglitz. I will get the ones not in English translated and I will email them onto him. And so with my personal thanks, I'm gonna hand it over to Carlos to close the session. Thank you, Laurie. Last, last comment from my side, Professor. I think that we are in, in a moment, it's a time to recognize that the current economic system is break. It's absolutely failed. And it's working just for a, a small group of multimillionaires. And it's not working for the people and it's not working for the planet. And I would like to say today uh, many thanks, many thanks, Professor, to share your ideas, your reflections about this challenge that we have together and to work together for change the conditions around the world and to work for another 
work possible for uh, all the countries uh, and include our perspective in your reflections too. Many thanks, Professor, and many thanks everyone here in the room to participate in this session and in this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Bye-bye. 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 Compass, coffee break time, and then let's reconvene at Boss 11? 11.30. 11.30. Thank you, everyone.